You two's The Unforgettable Fire is the first serious turning point of U 2s career. It's the record that allowed them to shift gears to show that they had more to offer than what people and critics thought. It's the record that turned a promising up-and-coming act into superstars. What's the story of this change? How did it happen? Was it all smooth or… Hello Top Butters, this is Simon Mas, a guy with a mastery music, the answers to those questions and no shame about it. This story begins months before even a single note of this music was conceived. 21st of May 1983, you two meet art curators Terry Emmert and Marianne Felbin of the Chicago Peace Museum. The lads were in the middle of their war tour, spreading their music and their message of peace and love. It was only natural that Emmert and Felbin wanted to meet them. The two wanted to create a new exhibition. Perhaps this new successful Irish band could donate a piece of handwritten lyrics for it? The two women brought along two catalogues of the museum's previous work. One was about Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement. The other was about the atomic bombing of Japan that ended World War II. It showed pictures and drawings of the survivors. The paintings were part of the therapy the survivors had gone through to externalize their pain and find some closure and catharsis. This exhibition was called The Unforgettable Fire. You two were struck by the museum work. They decided to donate the handwritten lyrics of New Year's Day, a song about the ongoing Cold War in Europe. They also promised to donate the stage backdrop and one of the white flags Bono had used during one of the shows when the tour was over. As the world tour rolled on, you two thought hard about their future. All we had to do was keep doing what we were doing and we would become the biggest band since Led Zeppelin, without a doubt. But something didn't feel right. We had something unique to offer. The innovation was what would suffer if we went down the standard rock route. We were looking for another feeling. But the seeds of change needed time to sediment and grow. When the band regrouped in Dublin at the end of 1983, it was clear that things had to change and how they had to change. It seemed we had done very well on Three Chords and The Truth, but we needed someone who could take our songs in a different direction. We had to change our methods our approach and some of the influences on our work. In other words, the producer and the studio. When they renegotiated their contract with Island Records, you two unveiled their plans for the new producer, Brian Eno. Their choice didn't make Island Records too happy. You two were straightforward folks doing straightforward music. Now that they were starting reaping the benefits of years of hard work, Brian Eno was going to bury their ideas under an avalanche of avant-garde intellectual abstract sounds. Uh -uh. But the enthusiasm of the band for the new direction won over all the objections and the project went on. You two were happy to work with Brian Eno. His work with David Bowie and Talking Heads had made history and his before and after the science fascinated the edge to no end. Given You two's desire to explore the interaction of musicians and recording space, Daniel Lanois and his unconventional recording practices were also a very welcome addition to the team. Now, for the studio. Manager Paul McInnes had looked high and low in and around Dublin for a suitable place. McInnes happened to mention his discontent to Lord Henry Monchars. As it happened, Monchars owns Lane Castle. He was happy to rent a place on the cheap as a rehearsal and recording space and as an accommodation for the night. The only condition was that you two also had to use the restaurant on the premises for food. I mean, 
almost too good to be true, right? If that wasn't enough, Slane Castle offered the sunny and open atmosphere. It was light years away from the dark, tiny spaces of Windmill Studios, where you two had recorded their first three albums. So off everyone went. This adventure was finally about to start, but not before you like this video and subscribe to the channel, because you want me to provide you with more and even better content, and liking and subscribing can help me with that. It takes you two clicks to make YouTube a better place. Thank you. Interacting with Eno and Lenoir's turned out to be easier than you two had anticipated. Eno acted as a counselor, discussing ideas, questioning the choices of the band and the way they worked to help them reach their new goals. Lenoir's too was instrumental to put everyone at ease and make sure everything was kept grounded and productive. Studios can be very technical and clinical, but with Danny, you could simply take the technical side as given and instead focus on capturing something amazing in the performance. And yet, with all the positive things we have discussed so far, the process of recording The Unforgettable Fire was not easy at all. Songs were recorded time and again, slowed down or sped up. A sort of homecoming was initially recorded at double the speed, for example. When it was slowed down, Bono recorded improvised lyrics and melody on the basic track. The result was edited down with the help of The Edge, who thought that was the first step before a complete rework of the song. It was not what Brian Eno had in mind. He convinced you two that the song was complete as it was, the sound of an improvised performance. He didn't have real lyrics, and it was blurred like a picture out of focus. But was this a drawback, or the essence of the different approach they were pursuing? Bono was obviously the hardest to convince about the new course. He always thought the lyrics had to be well-rounded and meaningful. Now, he was talked into providing impressionist and improvised performances, working from sketchy lyrics. Why write lyrics, they said to me. Imagine you're Japanese, imagine you're Italian, imagine you're Welsh. You hear it with your heart. And I, like an idiot, went along with it. The recording of the music was sometimes really quick, like in the case of 4th of July, but often the process was really slow, especially since you two questioned everything. Pride, in particular, was a pain. Nothing seemed to please the band. The song was slowed down, then sped up, then the guitar got a new sound because the old one was too muddy. Then the bridge was rearranged. They, after take, you two insisted they hadn't reached their peak performance. And take after take, Eno and Lanois got more and more worried. As I can tell you by personal experience, the more versions you record, the more difficult it becomes to decide which one is the best. But the real problem was that a feel of desperation of we're not making it was creeping into the song. By the time you two left Slane and returned to Windmill Studios, the tension between the band and the production team had become tangible. At this stage, the record should have been mixed down. You two wanted to re-record parts of the songs instead. Eno grew impatient and left. Lenoir's reminded you too that the budget was getting tight and that the deadline to deliver the complete album was even tighter. The band reluctantly agreed to allow him to complete the mixing of all the songs. Soon after its release, The Unforgettable Fire hit the number one spot in the UK. It would only manage to reach number 12 in the US, which is still quite an achievement. At the time, critics were divided between those who loved the new direction of the band and those who were critical about it. If you recall, Bono himself seemed to side with these critics. Well, 
I think is wrong. If you want songs, clear lyrics that point you at the right thing to do, 2 minutes 50 second singles, you are going to hate this album. If you want music that takes some time to know, that rewards repeated listening and that takes you on a breathtaking journey, perhaps you love it as much as I do. In fact, the song I like the least on the album is Pride. Not because it's a bad song, but because it has nothing to do with the rest of the music. It's like looking at a fairy land out of the window of your car and then suddenly you are in Manhattan for a minute or two. I agree. The lyrics are sometimes vague, but I never got the concept of self-indulgent, which is so terribly white and Anglo-Saxon. There are heartfelt attempts and shabby ones. Having said that, put a like to this video if you liked what I did, and drop me a line if you have suggestions that I can use to improve, or if you want to discuss some of the lyrics. You will find many other YouTube related videos in the description. This was Simon Mas. See you soon for more great music related content. Stay cool and keep your top hat on. Bye!